Excel tilde, like any Excel, is a function of sigma plus tau. Xr tilde, once again, is a function of tau minus sigma. But because there's a plus sign relative between them, this is the, this 
Tell it with respect to the argument, the same mistake D by D tau. Clear? Which means D by D tau of x tilde is equal to 0. Yeah. Um, we were discussing the geniality of open strings. The first thing we said was that open strings um, Open strings, unlike their closed string counterparts, on a circle have no strings. Just because open strings are void. No matter how many times you write it, you can always unwind it without facing any obstructions. And it's not, it's not closing on itself. Then, we, just, we wanted to discuss, uh, in round one, we're going to go through one or two rounds of this. We're going to discuss, uh, one, discuss in round one what happens to the boundary conditions of open strings at the end. So, uh, an open string was, uh, the x of the string could be expanded as x l plus x star. The boundary condition this could be, you know, x l is a function of tau plus sigma, x star is a function of tau minus sigma, could be worded as this. Just by chain rule. Then under the duality, x star tilde goes to x minus x star, where x l tilde goes to x l. Okay? So this, in real terms, in terms of the, x, the tilde becomes d by d tau of x tilde is equal to, is equal to 0. Okay, now, uh, now this looks like an innocuous change. It's not innocuous because it make, makes a huge difference. You see, what was the first boundary condition? The first boundary condition was that the normal derivative of x at the end of the string vanished. Now we find that the tangential derivative of x at the end of the string vanishes. Now the tangential derivative of something along the line vanishes. The derivative of something along the line vanishes. It's uh, another way of saying that that thing is constant along the line. Okay? So what this tells us is that the boundary conditions, that Neumann boundary conditions, the boundary conditions that we were first to by the requirement of Lorentz invariance originally, when we started discussing open strings, get dualized to Dirichlet boundary conditions. Dirichlet just means that x at the boundary is fixed to be a particular number. Now you might think, well, why did we encounter this when this possibility when we studied the open string last semester? And actually we did, if you remember. So I'll just remind you. When we studied the open string last semester, okay, we looked at the action del mu x, del mu x, del alpha x, del alpha x. Some conditions are on the plane and some are on the plane. What say that? Like brains. Like brains, exactly. This will, this will be interpreted as a deep brain, as we will see. But first, just let's look at the consistency of the boundary conditions. You see, when we try to derive the equations of motion for this, starting from this action, we varied the action and we threw away the total derivative, which was the integral of derivative of del alpha delta x del alpha x. Which was the same as del x, delta x times n dot integrated over the boundary by whatever stone cost with it. Some classic guys there. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we said, look, actually, we went through this comment last semester, though, I'm sure none of you remember. Uh, one way of doing it is demanding that this vanish. We didn't want a boundary contribution to the equations. We wanted this boundary term to vanish. Okay. So one possibility was that n dot delta x vanish. Second possibility was that delta x vanish. We chose the first possibility, n dot delta x vanish. And the reason we chose that was that we wanted to define a Lorentz invariant. So if delta x vanish along the boundary, then that means that x is fixed to a particular value. And there is no particular value of x that's Lorentz in Because a particular value is a location. And Lorentz transformation translations in particular move that location. Okay? So, what we had done was, you know, we pretended we had some nice highfalutin principle, just Lorentz and Lorentz, and we uh, um, employed <laughs> that, we said, well, we'd be interested in this boundary condition. Now we're finding that we were too narrow it. Because we started with that boundary condition. Then we put the theorem in a circle. And we de-dualize. And we generated the other boundary condition. Sort of really strange 
which then you start with something that looks totally consistent. I mean, by consistent, really obeys your written requirements and the rents and things. And then you read your eyes, and then you become a something that's not. And the underlying reason behind it is that the space that you build by TDI, it's not the same as the space you start with. For instance, a small circle becomes a big circle. Okay? So the Lorentz invariance in the original frame is not the same as Lorentz invariance in the, Of course, it was never any Lorentz invariance, it was a circle. But there would be if you took the, if you decompactified the X tilde circle. Even in this decompactification limit after TV validity, closed strings would recover new 26 dimensional Lorentz invariance, but not the open strings. Because of this fact. The open strings would have an endpoint at a particular point. Is this completely clear? Okay, we're going to understand this better. Okay, now, if string, see, what does this, in a picture, what does this say? It says that the open string, one end of the open string is fixed at one end, the other end is fixed, perhaps at some other end. These may or may not be the same, we discuss this. Okay, so, this open string is lying in a circle, there are two mark points in the circle, and the open string ends of one or the other. Is this clear? Okay. These are what we will eventually, what we will sort of call deep rates. But in order to understand this picture, uh, in order to understand this picture a little better, we're now going to um, generalize, you know, go back to the original open string picture and uh, look at it in a little more. Oh, I mean, wow. something is confusing here. So, there's two ideas of 2T duality, which one was an N to W shift that we've been playing with, and there's this guy, which makes sense in the in the decompact limit, non compact limit. X mm. are going to Y, X are. Mm. So, mm. I mean, whereas N to W would mean nothing, pretty much nothing in the non compact limit. Well, it and would be a limit of something, right? It would be, uh, it would be. Exactly. The radius equal to zero. Um, you see, in the non-compact limit, you have no windings, only momentum. Right. But if you have a zero size circle, okay. so you would have no momentum, time. only windings. So that's the way of thinking of the decompactification. Okay. You know, think of it as a limit. Mm -hmm. Okay? So there is a space that you can build entirely from windings, a space that you can build entirely from momentum. Okay? And, yeah. Fine. Now, uh, what I want to do is to go back to the original open string picture. Sorry, I'm just saying. I understand that is open string. How do you define the even in that picture? I've not yet defined it clearly. The different will be the hypersurface for the, on which the open string ends. This particular distinguished value of x at the end point. That hypersurface in space time will be called. Well, hang on for quite a bit. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to I'm going to go back to um, I'm going to go back to the um, uh, to the original open string and generalize the study of that open string. You see, the original open string before we did this, which had uh, neither boundary equations, had no particular length. Circle. As you might remember, so, you know, when we were studying closed strings on a torus, we found something interesting when we turned on uh, expectation values of constant B units. Remember the whole spectrum of the theory changed, we got some interesting narrow and compactification, all of that, by turning on an interesting value of B units. Now, what was B minus? B minus was a background value of some, some fields that entered the sigma model of the string. Well, another way of saying it was that it, B mu was one of the massless fields of the closed string. And so it could be turned on in a constant way. Because constant way is the equation k squared is equal to zero. Uh, as a background for which the string to propagate, on which the string could propagate. Okay? And you could ask, is there any analog of that for the open string? So what are the massless modes for the open string in space time? Open string massless modes are gauge fields. Okay? And what was the coupling of a gauge field to the open string? The gauge field, so firstly 
you remember what the field was in terms of oscillators it was uh, alpha minus one on vacuum is equal to zero but in terms of vertex operators you remember what it was exactly we discussed what this was last semester suppose you have a boundary of the string okay then the vertex operator corresponding to a gauge field lived only on the boundary and it was proportional to the tangential limit tangential limits along the of x times equal to pi x do you remember? because no sigma x is anyway zero because d sigma is zero if it's got to be proportional to one derivative it's got to be this yeah. and it is proportional to one derivative because that's how you make that that's the first one yeah. okay so this was the vertex operator corresponding to an open string okay great so we've got this vertex operator corresponding to the open string and now suppose we take k equals zero the vertex operator is just delta dx so suppose we turn down a constant background for the gauge field in space time suppose we turn down a constant background for the gauge field in space time okay what would be what how would this couple to the boundary of the strip? It would couple like a mu L P X mu, where this T is just an element along the boundary of the version. I'm just taking the infinitesimal vertex of it and exponentially on finite distance. No, that's fine, but uh... Given that all gauge fields are open strings, what does this mean? What? Given that gauge fields are open strings, but what is the background gauge? What is background? You should have asked this about the, the metric. Given that all met metric fluctuations are closed strings, what, what does the background mean? <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, it's the usual thing. It's, you know, um, you, it's like a field theory with a moduli space. Okay. Consider n equals 4 elements. Okay? So n equals 4 elements. Let's say SU2 n equals 4 elements has a one parameter set of vacuum. Okay? So you can be in a particular vacuum and then you move that vacuum by moving the value of the scalar field. Okay? So that's how this is. We've got a moduli space of vacuum outstrip. And you move from one vacuum by, uh, to the other by changing the condensate of some field that exists in the Okay. It's exactly like that. Okay, so uh, that's how you should think of the space of compactification of the string theory. From the point of view of space time, space of vacuum of the classical string theory. Okay, so if we work around one vacuum and want to reach the other vacuum, you have to turn on a condensate of some field of the first vacuum. Okay, that's exactly what we did for closed strings. And now we're doing the same thing for open strings. Okay? So, this is how we are supposed to modify the world sheet action if you've got a background, constant background gauge field. Actually, uh, more generally, if it's a function of x, you would modify it in general as a function of x. But in general, this would break the formal invariance. Which would be the statement that in general, gauge field background will not solve the equations of function. Not a way Maxwell, Einstein Maxwell equations. But a constant background gauge field always does. How do we know that? From the game. From the, from, the, um, from the point of view of the world sheet, it does because the theory remains at most quadratic. This addition is linear from the point of view of space time, we know that because a constant background gauge field is locally pure gauge and therefore it cannot, doesn't affect F mu ever, so will not affect how well the equations of function are obeyed or not. Okay, so while you could play the game of turning on a const, a non-constant thing, then we would have to call Pranjal back and ask him to do the beta function cal calculation on the boundary of the, uh, uh, on the string. Okay, and that's an interesting exercise. But uh, when uh, for the simplest case, a is equal to constant, we don't have to do anything. Just obviously, uh, a solution. So now we've discovered something. We've discovered that open strings sitting on a circle have a natural generalization, which is the close analog of the generalization of closed strings 
sitting on the circle. The closed strings, you could deform the metric, or you could deform the Bimini field. These were the master strings. The closed string, here you can deform by the master string fields. The open string. Okay? And all it does is change the, the action, which we didn't have, just to include an additional object. Now, let us uh, let us remember also that we have this nice generalization involving channel factor factors for uh, for all the strings. Remember the, the simplest string was an oriented string, so there was a beginning and an end. Okay, and you remember that when we had open strings with channel pattern factors, we had uh, we had uh, a UN gauge field. Firstly, from the point of view of the word sheet, there were just n squared different sectors in the quantization, just labeled by i and j. You fix i and j, that gives you, and then the oscillators that gave you those vector Okay? From the point of view of the space time, each i j mode corresponded to a particular matrix component of the gauge field. And the different i j modes made up the whole matrix of the gauge field. Okay? So, now, what is the analog? of a Wilson line, a U1 Wilson line, for a UN gauge. By Wilson line, I just mean constant value of the gauge, the, 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 the gauge thing. Okay? If you think about it, you can say that the analog of that is constant values of AMU, such that different constant values commute. Why is that? Because we're looking for configurations of A that carry no field strength. So derivatives make you carry a, carry a field strip, or commutators make you carry a field strip. Okay? Okay? So, if you got A views in different directions, they should commute with each other. At the moment, we're even, we, 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 so, so the, 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 the picture of pure, a locally pure gauge configuration. Okay? Carries over, which we're very familiar with the UN theory, carries over to the UN theory. Just consists of commuting matrices. Wait, there more than one matrix? Yes, yes, yes. There, there would be more than one matrix only if there was more than one circle. Ah, okay. Okay? So but in the simplest case, if there's one circle, there's only one matrix, all matrices. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, so I will just say that. There's this new index which, for which there was a commutation. But if we were just at one circle, that's even simpler. Any matrix computes with itself. If you have many circles, there's this lovely fact that all diagonal, all commuting matrix matrices can be simultaneously diagonalized by gauge transformations. With one matrix, you have the simpler statement that any matrix can be diagonalized by gauge transformations. <laughs> <laughs> any constant matrix can be diagonalized by gauge transformations. So let's deal with the one main one circle at the moment. We diagonalize this. Okay? So what this then tells you, okay, what this then tells you is that you have uh, a gauge field in space time in which AII is equal to alpha i, AIJ is equal to alpha i delta i. Okay? Now, if we were dealing with such a field in space time, okay, in the IJ set. Okay? The beginning point sees the gauge field alpha i. And the end point sees the gauge field minus alpha j. Okay? Because this guy has charge 1 under the gauge field, where this guy has charge minus 1 under the gauge field. It's just a statement that the open strings are adjoint kind of object. Is this clear? So, at the beginning point, what we would have is this delta of uh, uh, of alpha i, so delta of x times alpha i, and at the end we will have delta of x times alpha j, but with the minus. Okay. So if we've got this open string, this one x. The turning on this gauge field in space time modifies the word sheet action in the IJ set by alpha i L T x and this one's at zero. Uh, 
minus alpha j del t x and this one's at uh, i. What? No, that's for the AIGs. Wait, you see, we turn on the background like this, and then we're doing the quantization of the string in that background. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, so we've got the full IJ, IJ set. Now, in this here, in this here, we plug in, um, in this, we plug in the mode expansion. Okay. These terms, the bulk terms, were just as they were before. Okay? But um, every non zero momentum sector, of course, um, equal to go, alpha n cos sigma pi sorry cos sigma n okay sum over n plus alpha plus uh, x zero to zero Now, uh, yeah, why, why am I getting so sorry? Why, why don't you ask me? Yes. Um, suppose I plug this into there. Uh, I wanted to make the argument that the oscillators are unaffected. Why is that the case? Let's see. Suppose I plug this in here. This only cares of this thing. This thing is only integrated at the bottom. So, what's the full action for the oscillators? There's an alpha n dot squared plus n squared alpha n squared minus uh, and we're getting uh, let's call these, uh, sorry, the two different uses of alpha n.
just a second. Uh, you can get rid of this by what shift? So alpha n is to alpha n. Uh, plus zeta i and zeta j to t. Same thing. Waiting, but the oscillator is just totally up. You know, I think 
that I could prove. Let, let, let's do this honestly. Uh, let's let's do the whole thing honestly. Okay, just let's read one time. Is this great? I'm going to start. I'm going to start like this. Suppose we have a reaction which was s is equal to one over four by alpha prime. Then we had x sub squared minus x sub squared. Plus um, x of zero dot uh, plus x of zero dot with some alpha with some zeta one minus x of pi dot with some zeta. Let's suppose it has some action. Now let's start honestly uh, and compute uh, everything. Okay. Uh, Let's first find the equation of motion for this action. Okay? So we should vary this action for, with, for, with respect to every point, including the points at the bottom. Because the points at the bottom are very equals. Okay. So of course the equation of motion at bulk points is the same. The equation of motion at boundary points is, uh, is the issue. This gives you nothing. The equation of motion from here is what? L is zero at delta x dot zero. Okay, I'm confused about this. Let me go on making an assumption, which I cannot now justify, but I'll explain to you things to us. Okay, and please remind me if I forget to. Okay, I'm confused about this. That's just one.
understand it will be some obvious. Let me move on. Let me move on. Let me not take more time now. By next class I promise I'll give you good explanation. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Please assume that for a moment I will give you a good explanation by next class. Say something wrong. Anyway. Uh, just let's assume that this is the case. That the oscillators are just unaffected and all that's affected is this. Okay. Is it possible that this non-abelian gauge field is a trace sort of thing and things you have to take the trace here and not include here? Because 1 minus minus 1 to the power n, the cost factor producing a minus 1 to the power n, and not that the percentage of this is trace. Hmm. from the quantity. Space time, these are charged particles and they see a Wilson line only changing their boundary conditions. So it's only something that goes all the way around the circle. So we make tau, the tau circle, the Euclidean torus. Then it's clear that for the oscillators this will not work. I mean, oh, for, for, it will only count, contribute, you know, then what we would do is we would, in the path integral, we would expand in space and in time for things that were, um, uh, things that were periodic around the circle plus things that were winding around the circle. That's only the winding modes that I would contribute. And then by doing the Poisson Lisa that we talked about two three lectures ago, that would correspond to contributing and changing only the zero mode set. You know, from that point of view, it's sort of, I think it's totally clear. If you think of this as how it affects the path integral, it only affects the path integral for the winding sets. Is it something like uh, that integral 
zero or x dot because just a x dot sitting alone. Yes. X dot then equals zero part. Yeah, if if we exactly so if we were in some sort of compact time direction. Oh, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. And in exactly doing, going to Euclidean space does that. So suppose we were doing a partition function. Suppose we were doing a partition function on the circle. Okay, so that this guy now becomes a circle. Then the way we would do this path integral is expand the modes of x's in modes that are periodic around the time circle. Plus modes that might around it. Okay? The modes that are periodic around the time circle would not see this at all because it would be killed by the integration by parts. The modes that wind around the time circle would see it. But they would see it precisely in the way of effective, because as you remember, the winding modes in the path integral just affect the momentum sum. In, uh, uh, in the Hamiltonian point of view, they would see it precisely by modifying just the zero modes. In the way that I'm going to discuss now. Okay? I'm just not saying how directly from canonical quantization I get that conclusion. I'm thinking of this wrong uh, I'm probably thinking of wrong in some stupid way. Uh, function, uh, I think perhaps you see already that we would get exactly the answer that we would get with unmodified oscillators, but a modified zero mode sector. So I know this is right. There's some way of saying it directly from what uh, that is not. Hey, let's not waste the time. Let's not waste the time. I'll, I'll, I'll clear this up. Okay? Let's just assume that this is the case and we uh, we function just with, uh, just for the zero. Something very stupid to say. But uh, I'm not stupid. Okay, so. Now let's assume that this, that, 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 that this is the case and we, fun we function with just the zero modes. Okay. Now we're going to ask how is the zero mode action affected by the presence of this time? Okay? Let's call this, whatever it is, let's call it zeta. So 
So let's let's call this whole thing zeta beta. tilde was after so plus minus the same thing as integral 0 to pi b tau of x there may have been a minus
Now, some of you may be thinking, I started this class by saying there was no winding in the open string sectors. So, what am I talking about? But there's no winding in the open string sectors when they had the boundary conditions that d sigma of x at the boundary was zero. Because then you could shh. But now remember, in the trivial description, x is forced to end at a point. Okay? So, this is telling you that I've got my circle, the string starts here, it has to end there again, but it can do it. So it's telling me that the string starts and ends at the same point. If zeta 1 is zeta 1. But of course, you can do it by either doing this, or by winding once and doing, or by winding twice and doing. And as for the closed strings, the momentum in the original description maps to winding number in the dual description. What have we learned? What we've learned is that in the case of modes that fall in the, in the original open string were uncharged. They begin and end at the same point. So that's what this algebra has taught us so far. Okay? Because so far what we had was just that there was some point where the, the x equals 0 boundary ended, some point where the x equals pi boundary ended. And these were uncorrelated. Now we've learned that if this guy was uncharged, the simpler case, those two points are just the same. But we've learned more. We've learned that if we look at one of these charged modes, one of these modes where i was not equal to j, so we had zeta 1 minus zeta 2, then they won't begin at the end at the same point. Now let's put a geometrical picture to this. You see, the geometrical picture we can put to this is the following. We've got a circle. Let's say we've got the point zeta 1. Uh, I'm going to flip this sign out a little bit. Sign this. Zeta 2, zeta 1. <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? Zeta 1, and zeta 2. Now let's look at n equals 0. That is telling you that the, that the let x as you go from 1 to 2 is extending from zeta 1 to zeta. That's good. Okay? Let's look at n equals 1. It's telling you that as you go from 1 to 2, it's going from zeta 1 to zeta 2. Plus a circle. Okay? n equals minus 1, this, minus a circle. And so on. So you see what, what we are saying, what this formula tells us in geometry is that there are two marked points on the circle. Okay? And the string has to begin at the first mark point and end at the second mark point. And then it can do it either in the straightest way it can or after a few windings. But it has to begin and end at different mark points. Is this clear? Okay. So now we've, 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 come, we've understood something very interesting. What we've understood is that this, these Dirichlet boundary conditions are not totally random. Firstly, the locations, of course everything is to an overall translation on the circle. We are only looking at differences. Okay? This is, by, by the way, the statement that, an o, that a U1 gauge field on the tridualized, on the undue tridualized side, doesn't affect the boundary conditions of any of the strings. Because every adjoint field is uncharged under U1. It's only the SUN part that affects it. So, of these n eigenvalues, the trace part affects nothing. So that, and that corresponds to overall rotations of the daily fast. But it's the differences that affect things. Okay? So we've got this mark point zeta 1, the other mark point zeta 2. Things that, modes that were, were in the ijth sector, the original theory, map to modes that uh, end, begin, begin zeta 1, end at zeta 2. If they have momentum originally, they also have some winding. Is this clear? What? No, no momentum. No momentum. Uh, as you can see in many ways. The first way is, of course, that the beginning and end are bent in Momentum means moving on the side. Okay? But the second way of saying it, uh, seeing it is just from the boundary conditions. The 
boundary conditions tell you that uh, uh, the ends of the string are pinned to points. So of course the zero one cannot move. Clear? Okay, I just said the same thing twice. Basically. Okay. okay, I just said this is in the pictures. Okay, so in the unterealized frame, we had momentum. In the derealized frame, we have winding. It's unlike in the closed string where we have both momentum and winding on both sides. In the open string picture, one of the sides has momentum and the other side is winding. One of the sides has free motion, that's why it loves moving. The other side has marked points for the boundaries, that's why it loves winding. And we've seen a clear, clean correspondence. The correspondence is that the eigenvalues of the Wilson line give you, Wilson line is just my sophisticated way, or my, my, my way of saying the expectation value the, the background value of A. Not my background value of A, background value of A times R. That's this R. Okay? As many of you know, a constant value of A on a circle is not quite gauge meaning, meaningless because it's integral over the circle is gauge invariant. Okay? And that's 2 pi R times A. That, that's the Wilson line. Okay? So this, the diagonal values of this Wilson line on the original side correspond to the positions of allowed beginning and end points of the open string on the final side. Is this clear? Okay. Now, the after the duality is open strings are allowed to begin and end at particular points. The locations at which they are allowed to begin and end are called points. Okay? Notice that if we had just a U1 here, just no chat pattern factors, there's only one point. What was this actually? All strings begin and end at the same point. If we have a UN theory, there are in general in different places where things can begin and end. Okay? And this, in a very clear way, geometrizes these chat pattern factors. You can think of these n different places as n, what they call brains. And an ij string is a string that emerges from the i-th brain and ends on the j -th. Is this clear for the diagram? The i -th string emerges from zeta i and ends at zeta j. Okay? So what we what we what you imagine is a picture with n different surfaces. And we have open strings that can begin and end in the same one. But it can also begin at one and end at the other. The n squared such open strings, that was the n squared chat pattern factors. And it's just labeling which brain it starts from and which brain it ends up. Okay? So this is the t-dual description. This is the t-dual description. Okay? Of the open string on a circle. We will continue with our discussion of it with any questions so far. If you take the decompact limit of the original guy, of the original guy, it looks like all the brains sit on each other. Yeah, it looks like all the brains sit on each other. Um, now, if you took the decompactified limit of the original guy, um, yeah, all the brains do sit on each other, basically for the following reason. That, you see, the way that the gauge field affected um, oh, you are saying there is no non trivial Wilson line anymore. Yeah, but, yeah uh, the way that the gauge field affected the, 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 the open string was by changing the quantization of momentum. Hmm. Now, momentum is essentially continuous. Okay. Okay? How does this map to the original in the next picture? In the next picture, we are a zero size circle. So, you might have thought that there was no, everything had gone. But of course, we get the more the winding points. Okay. Now, the way that these brains affect the winding modes is that it affects the quantization of the winding modes. But because any finite number can be built up is built up uh, 
and with so many windings that small effect is negligible. Okay. It's the same, it's a continuum. It's a, on both sides you're just recovering a continuum. You get the continuum from the winding side because you've got zero, zero size circles. The fractional position of the brains has not gone to zero, but it doesn't matter very much. Okay. Similarly on the momentum side, the fractional change in winding uh, sorry, momentum has not gone to zero. But it doesn't matter, matter very much because it's a fractional change in a unit that's going to zero. Okay? Okay? But there is the other limit that Robert, the opposite of what Ronald asked about that is sort of uh, also interesting. And that limit is, suppose we take the original theory and take it on the zero size. Now the new theory is now an infinite size circle. It's just a deeper, deeper path. But we're left with these brains. Now, we could take a limit such that we keep the brain positions fixed as we take the decompact equation. And we're left with the brains just there. So this tells us that there is a new consistent kind of thing to do even in the theory with no compact equation. Even in the theory with the on R20 things. There's a new kind of consistent uh, background machine theory we should be studying. And this is the background with these brains. And we're forced to study it because we could achieve it by starting with constant, consistent theory and taking an appropriate limit. Okay? So, whereas we get the idea of these brains from duality, in the end, the circle is not a necessary ingredient for this one. It's just something that helps you uh, argue that they must be there. But you can have these brains also in just non compact space. Is this clear? between states on the two sides of the duality before and after the event. Okay. What about the guy that was alpha in the i i i frame? Before the dualizing, let's look at alpha minus one i i. Okay? This was as usual a for some. Okay. Let's look at it at n equals zero. This gives the usual massless state for Okay? Because there's no momentum contribution from this because n is zero. What about the state which was alpha minus one i j? In general, this is not a massless state for Because though it's alpha minus one, there's always a momentum contribution. Because now the momentum quantization is not n by r, it's n minus zeta by r. So even if I have zero, zero, you get the zeta by alpha. Okay? So what we see is that in the original theory, when our zeta i's are not all equal, okay? We, instead of having n squared massless k goes on, we have only n the massless k goes on. Is this clear? Was this not clear? Okay, sure. Not clear, clear. Not clear. Okay. Um, let's see. So let's remember what the what the mass square formula was. M squared was equal to some m l minus one, some alpha prime, by, uh, some factors which I love to think to get right. Alpha prime, four alpha, four by alpha prime, two by alpha, prime, something like that. Okay. But now, if this is m squared in the non-compact direction. There is also a contribution here from plus alpha prime by 2 p25 square. Is that it? Okay. Now this p25 squared was condensed. What was its condensation? It was n minus zeta i and zeta j by r. Okay, so now suppose we take nl equals 1 and zeta equals zeta j and n equals 0. Then this is 0 and this is 0. And so we get a master state. On the other hand, even if we take nl equals 1, if and we take n equals 0, if zeta i minus zeta 
zika j is not zero. Of course, if zika is zika j is an integer that's as good as being zero. Because then we can shift it. So let's say some fractional number between zero and Okay? Then there's no value of n which will make this guy. So you will have, in general, no massless cage fields. Clear? Okay? So what we've gone from, gone from is a situation where we had n squared massless cage fields, which would have been the case if all the zikas were equal. Zika n and zika j was zero. Then we have n squared different cage fields. Uh, n squared different massless cage fields. Now we've got a situation where we've got only n massless gauge fields. Now gauge fields, this is the usual story, gauge fields can't develop a mass consistently except by one mechanism, which is the Higgs mechanism. Okay? And what's going on here is the background value of this Wilson line is Higgsing. The background value of the Wilson line okay, is Higgsing uh, is Higgsing un down to un1 to the power what are the scalar fields being written? What are the scalar fields being written? Uh, you see, this background value of the Wilson line, from the point of view of the decompactified theorem, from the point of view of the 25 dimensional theorem, is a scalar field. Ah. And it's being written. Okay. Is this clear?
see this Wilson line here, if it shifts by this, pe this, this period, it's basically the result that so Wilson line affects physics only by its effect on boundary conditions. Okay? When it shifts by this guy being an integer, it's like it's not being there. So what it's done is if you follow the Wilson line go from zero to an integer, what it does is relabel states. The state was that that was n equal zero on the first thing, shifts to n equal one in the second. This is even more visual in the second description. Let's look at what happens when I take zeta two and shift it by two pi. What I do is I move the position of this plane and come back. You see, so I come back to the same theory. However, I've not come back to the same state. Because suppose I had something that was stretching from here to here. Now if I move it around here, it continues to stretch from here to here for half. If it was winding no times around the circle, after I moved it, it will come back winding one time around the circle. Okay? So this slightly abstract mathematical spectral load flow in the anti-dualized picture is a beautiful geometrical, beautiful and obvious geometrical picture. Uh, okay? So shifting zetas by integers, shifting zetas by integers has this very simple thing. You're just taking a brain and going down the circle. It's the scale. Okay. Excellent. Now, yeah, yeah. So we, we said that the 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 the, that the, the mode. Sorry, we said that the um, that the mode, the open string that went from here to here, continued to be massless, whereas the open string that went from here to here uh, uh, that went from here to here was massive. Okay. Now, notice the following thing. There was this mode, there, there was this field that was A25 in the original description. Whose eigenvalues of the Wilson line? Who's, you know, which got higgs to give you the, uh, the massive the gauge goes out in the in the in the compactified bit. Now there is a puzzle that you might at first think of the following puzzle. And the puzzle was this that you see there was an A25 in the original theory. Because all open string fields lived to 25 plus 1 dimension. Because the zero mode was free to move around in all directions, including the 25th direction. But in the new theory, in the new theory, the string cannot move in the 25th direction. There's no momentum in the 25th direction. So there should be no gauge field in the 25th direction. Okay? So now, what is the interpretation of this mode? This open string of x25. See, we already, two minutes ago, we discussed the open strings of x1 to x24 that went from i to i. They, those gave us the u1 gauge bosons in the t unit. But what about the open string of x25 that goes from i to i? This is like the open strings of x, x1 to x24. This is a, a muscle smooth. Before t dualizing, what was it? It was just the Wilson line. Yeah. The eigenvalues of the Wilson line. After t dualizing, what does it become? Well, we've already seen that. Way. We've seen that the positions of the Wilson lines in the anti dualized picture map to the positions of the brains after t dualizing. So the mode, the open string mode of x25 that goes from i to i must correspond to a, a fluctuation in the location of the brain. You see, it's zero mode certainly corresponds to moving the whole brain. So, but zero mode is just one member of the whole vertex operator living at k equals zero. 
if we look to the vertex operator not at k equals 0 but at finite k, what it will do is, in a local way, move the brain. This goes to a scale. You know, that's same philosophy. Okay? So what we've seen is something quite remarkable. What we've seen is that these surfaces, which originally emerged as hyper surfaces on which twins can aim, actually are dynamic. Because there is an open swing mode whose net effect is effectively to move these surfaces in a position dependent manner. Which means that these surfaces behave like the surface of a drum. You can tell. They can manage it. They because move in 24 plus 1 dimensions. That's right. That, they, that, they, well, these surfaces, the ones we've discussed so far, are localized in only one direction. They co-dimension one brains. So they can move only in the 25th direction. Okay? But if we individualize more types as we will in just one minute, okay, then they will be, move, be able to move in every direction in which they are localized. Do you understand? Just like a string can vibrate in 24 directions. Because it lives in one direction. Yeah, yeah. Vibrates in the other 24. You know, these brains live in every direction except one. So they can only vibrate in that one direction. So there was this only, only this one mode. The mode of X25 to itself. Is this clear? Richard, you want to clearly talking about a X25 direction vibration that yes. depends on other 24. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So what is that field in the string theory? It's X25 direction. It's exactly this. It's alpha, it's this. It's del x25, if pi k, kx, where this k. Oh, right, right. K is 24 dimensions. Yes. I see. So the k is roughly the, okay, so the drum profile. Yes, exactly. Okay. Now, you speaking, this is the, you see, upon compactification, this is the k25 which comes out. The k25 after compact. Upon compactifying, A25 is a scalar. Yeah, so that should give the position of the. That, after T-duality, huh. becomes the position of the. Okay. A25 itself is just in the original script to Wilson. Yeah. The Wilson line T-dualizes to the position. Yes. Is this clear? So, in particular, this is a new T-dualized theory, there's no child pattern factor. What? There's no child pattern factor. Well, the, you could say child pattern factor is much better to say there are n different brains. And these n different brains are the beginning and end points of strings. Hmm. So, one thing is basically that if you take a string between 1 and 2 and a string between 3 and 4, they can't interact anymore. They can't interact directly. But of course, they could do it by three level exchange or something. But exactly, the three level interactions are between a string of 1 and 2 and 2 and 3. But we knew that already from gauge theory. Why? From the structure of matrices. <laughs> gauge invariants. Okay? Uh, excellent. Excellent. Now, um, excellent. Uh, Okay, is this picture clear? Okay, now I think I'm going to move to a, a little calculation. Let's quickly do that. Um, but, uh, uh, okay, I just want to, you know, the, the, the facts about deep brains that are important are calculationally rather trivial. You saw the net level of calculation we did in this class was <laughs> simple and trivial. Okay, but conceptually very simple. What we realize is that there are, there are these new objects in spring. They are objects because they can vibrate. Their vibrations are captured by particular modes of the open string. So after you've tedialized, the interpretation... Okay, now let's tedialize and take the decompactification. By the way, I did everything with one circle. But suppose I have P circles. I could tedialize them all P circles. And then decompactify all of them in the TDU. What will I be left with? I'll be left with B brains which are co-dimension P. Okay? So that tells us that there are B brains in the Gulamic string 
of every co-dimension. Now, d brains are labeled by not by co-dimension, but by the number of spatial dimensions. So there's a d zero brain, which lives just in time. There's a d one brain, which is like a string. A d two brain, which is two by brain, and so on, all the way up to uh, d twenty four brains, d twenty five brains, with the odd to just open strings. <laughs> Not open strings. Okay? Because that's just saying that the string can end it. Okay? Fine then. This argument from T-duality tells us that all these objects exist. We've just seen that they're dynamic. in which the mass of open and closed strings is of 1. The mass density of these d brains is order 1 over g, when g is the string number. So in string perturbation theory, when g is taken to be extremely small, these objects have extremely large mass. Okay? So order 1 energies cause them to vibrate only a very little bit. So they are like big huge guys, very much like dealing with solid objects. Okay. A soliton is a background, it's a classical background, because it's actually dynamical. But, you know, you get that by quantizing the 
zero modes of the solid arm. It's, it's a different procedure from just doing the canonical quantization of the field. Because the solid arm is big, huge, infinitely heavy in the classical way. It's very similar kind of thing. Okay? That is the reason that string perturbation theory sees them different. But that's the only way in which they do. For instance, if you look at the D1 brain, Okay? That is, in every other way, just to be thought of in this way. And you will see as we go on, in fact, the next class, we, maybe soon after the next class, we are planning to start on the discussion of uh, type 2 theories. And you will see that in type 2 theories, there is in fact a strong weak coupling duality, in which fundamental strings and D1 strings are easy. So not only are they not pseudo-objects, they're very, in a very real sense, as much objects as ordinary strings. Okay? It's just that in perturbation theory, they're much heavier than strings. So they look a bit different. You go outside perturbation theory, it's just as much objects as strings. Yes, that's very important to understand. Yes? So, you know how in the UN theory on circle, we have this uh, these things are like theta states and there are Fourier transform n states, right? Uh, you can uh, take a Fourier transform over all the thetas with some e power i n theta. Yes. The so theta is what? Is what? The uh, theta is the, the, the angle of the, the Wilson. Theta 1 by theta. Theta 1 by theta. Yes, yes, yes. Right, like theta 1 by theta. Yes, yes. So if you took uh, one of those n states for one of the u ones, mm -hmm. would that be like a deep brain slice of the world? Huh. Uh, yes, I think that's right. That, that would essentially be giving it momentum. Mm. It would, you are basically saying, make a wave function for these things. Mm. Yes, I think that's, that's, that, that, that's it. I think that's right. Though, you know, it's not something that will be easy, easy to see here. Yeah, because for us, these are classical objects. Well, that's exactly what I was asking. Yeah. For us, these are classical objects just because they're so heavy. Okay? We're going to see in a moment how that works out, but they're going to have mass or mass densities of order 1 by g. And anything that is infinitely heavy in the h-bar goes to 0 limit behaves effectively classically. Okay. Because we're not going to see that directly, but of course, conceptually, that's right. Mm -hmm. At the level of the polar covariance, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. At the level of the polar covariance, we've mm -hmm. just done what I showed you. We just have open strings with funny boundary definitions. That forces these open strings to end that particular manifold and forces the existence of a new mode which behaves exactly like it is vibrations of these manifolds. Okay. okay, so it's quantizing these open strings that gives you the vibrations of the debris. Very much like how field theory in the present of solid earth. Very much like it. Okay. But let, let me quickly, okay, great. Any other questions? Okay. Now, the next thing I'm going to try to do is to discuss what the tension of a device is. Okay, we probably won't have the time to go through all of this uh, today, but let, let me start this. Okay, 
alpha prime to what power can be fixed by dimensional analysis? Okay, let's fix it by dimensional analysis. So suppose we had, uh, so, so first let's do what is Newton comes to the uncommon. Okay, so what we would have had is 1 by, g, 1 by g squared by alpha prime to some power by square root g times r. Okay, we want this whole thing to be dimensionless. Uh, this is d 26 x. r is two derivatives. So it becomes like g 24 x. Okay? So this tells us that this should be alpha prime to some limit. Okay, in the uncompactified theory. And some number, that number will be conventional. Okay, let's say that there is some uh, there's some overall A26, some number which we want. Okay. Now, suppose I take this theory and I compactify it in a circle to radius r. Okay? So, um, okay, uh, let, let me be really, really even very fancy. So, suppose there's some A26, some A. What is Newton's constant? So, well, Newton's constant is usually defined as a thing like for 1 over 16 pi g Newton is the coefficient. And so we would conclude that 16 pi g Newton, g26 let's call it, is equal to g squared alpha prime to the power 12 by a. Okay? Now suppose I compactify it in a circular radius. What I will get is an effective, an additional 2 pi r a. And then I do the same calculation. So I'll get 16 pi g25 is equal to g squared alpha prime to the power 12 a, but then a will be this by a 2 pi r. Is that clear? Now, this calculation that I've done here, okay, this calculation that I've done here works also in the t-dual framework. So, if I did a t-dual, okay, and I started with some uh, some theory, but with String coupling, this free parameter string theory, let's call it g tilde. Okay? Then I will conclude that 16 pi g25 is equal to g tilde square alpha prime to the power 12 times a times 2 pi r tilde. Just because, I mean, I'm TDO observer, I just do the same math. However, the effective 25 dimensional theories that you get are the same. So these two, these two Newton's constants must be equatable to each other. Okay? Because that was the whole logic, right? T duality gave you the same effective load of 25 dimensional theory. And therefore, we conclude that G square by R is equal to G tilde square by R tilde. Okay? But R tilde was alpha prime by and therefore we have g squared by um, r squared by r squared alpha prime is equal to g to the power. Okay. So we concluded something very important. What we concluded is this that if we do a T duality then, in order that the two 25 dimensional theories agree with each other, that is, yes. the string coupling constant of the two original, their parent 26 dimensional theories could not have been equal, but it's 
instead have to be related by this relationship. Is that clear? Okay. Now, I'm going to use this fact to try to, tell, to understand what I can say about the ratios of, you see, I'm going to try to understand what I can say about the ratios of the uh, tensions of uh, uh, de brains of different dimensions. Okay, we've already argued that d brains have a tension, they fluctuate, and so and the leading long distance order must be governed by such effective number go to action. Because anything that has a tension and fluctuates at leading long distance order is governed by a number go to, go to action. Just because it's the lowest uh, two dimensional action. Goes back to a question I think Ashish asked at the beginning of the last semester. Oh, maybe the beginning of this semester. Why? Why is it not? Lowest. Okay. Right. So, what we must have is that the action is square root g induced times something. Now, what I want to do is to try to understand. What I want to do is to try to understand how. These T's are related between dimensions. Okay? So suppose I've got a T brain. This will be of this form. And I want to understand if I can understand if I can if I can figure out what T P minus 1 is in terms of T. Okay, what's the basic physics logic? The physics logic is just that we can go from T P to T P minus 1 by T divided. Okay? Now uh, actually do is to compute um, a one loop diagram uh, with two disks. That's how we actually compute it. But conceptually this is the easiest way to do it. Okay? But now do you remember the general rule? The general rule was that any genus G manifold in string theory was weighted by G to the power genus minus two. Also a disk was counted as genus one, or half, you know, any. It was, I tried to say that sophisticated. The rule was that, G, that a sphere was weighted by one over g squared, a torus was weighted by nothing, and a disk was weighted by one over g. Each hole was like half a genus. That's all. You remember this rule that we developed last time. It came from the coupling of the dilaton to the world sheet from square root r. This coupling. And the fact that square root r integrated over, over a Riemann surface gave you 2g minus 2. It's Euler thing. Okay, this is, this is where it came from. But it doesn't matter. You just remember this rule, right? This tells us, this general consideration tells us that Tp must scale like 1 over g. Okay? Dimensional analysis tells us that this. <coughs> so Tp must scale right, up to a number. So it must be some zeta p by g g straight times alpha prime to the power p plus 1 by 2 because there is d p plus 1 x so t p must be equal to this because z p is some pure number zeta p is question what can we say about zeta p answer what we are going to do is to give you that. Okay? So, let us say that we had a, deep, a P brain wrapping a circle in the original anti dualized description. So, then there is an effective tension 
for the p minus one dimensional object. Okay, so there is some p p minus one effect, which is simply equal to zeta p two pi r times g alpha prime to the power p plus one. Right. Okay, so we have this deep brain wrapping the circle from the uncompactified point of view. It's one dimensional lower brain with this effective tension. Is this clear? I just did the integral. That looks like that. Okay? On the other hand, we can denuance. If we denuance without any dimensional reduction, we just get a p minus one dimension. Okay? So there, so there we have a p p minus one. So given by this formula, except we have to use g tilde instead. Okay? So we, get, we just get a t p minus one, except we use g tilde instead of g. So we get this zeta p minus one. No two pi are needed. Okay? Times g tilde alpha prime to the power p by two. Is that clear? So there are two different ways of seeing the effect of brain tension from the one lower dimension point of view, and these must be the same. Now, in order to make this useful, we take this and we take the square root of that. So g tilde that is equal to g square root alpha prime by r. Okay, so we substitute that in here. So we find that. Zeta p into 2 pi r by g alpha prime to the power p plus 1 by 2 is equal to zeta p minus 1 times g uh, now alpha prime to the power p plus 1 by 2 r That's it. Now lots of things cancel. R cancel with R. Alpha prime cancel with alpha prime. G cancel with G. So we see that everything is consistent. We said that G, zeta is a pure number. We find it's a pure number. Okay? But it's consistent only if zeta uh, p is equal to zeta p minus 1 by p. So on general grounds, we find that the tension of the deep brain, if it, he does indeed have tension and so on, has to, has to be like this. We even got the 2 pi to the power of p, that's very impressive. Okay? All we have to do is find one number. Okay? And that one number we're going to do by we're going to do, find by an honest calculation, which we'll go through next class. Okay? And we will better understand the effective action on the world of the deep brain also next time. Next class will be our last lecture on. Goes on extreme. Uh, we we'll, in the in the class after that we will move on to the super strength. Also, next class I have to clear up the confusion about these oscillators and the inputs and plus. When we say deep brain mapping is circuit, what does it mean? We say black deep brain, but one of the it means that the boundary conditions are that uh, it let's 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 suppose. So let's take an example. Suppose we have a one brain wrapped in the x What does it mean? It means that the boundary conditions of all the non-compact directions are something fixed. You understand? Because the one brain has only one direction free for the strings to move on. That one direction is in this non-compact uh, area. So all the other directions are at some fixed directions. Okay? By wrapping I just mean this. 
See, given a D-brain, there are some directions of space in which you've got Neumann boundary conditions. The string is free to move in those directions. Those are the world volume directions of the string. Some directions of space in which you've got Dirichlet boundary conditions. The string is fixed in those directions. When I say wrapping, I mean the circle direction is entirely normal. Is this clear? Other questions, comments? Okay. Okay, so I'm